So in a fasting state, you measure blood sugar and you measure blood insulin levels. And the question is, at, at, to hold your blood sugar normal, how much insulin does your body have to make? And if you are insulin sensitive and you're, you want to hold your blood sugar here, then you might give, if you're sensitive, you keep your insulin down here. But if you're insulin resistant, you might still have the same blood sugar value, but it takes an insulin up here to keep it down there, to hammer it down there. This person's insulin resistant, and that person it will be, by analogy, carbohydrate intolerant. If you have a low, a normal blood sugar and a lowish normal insulin, then you're sensitive. And in a study done actually here in the peninsula by um, Dr. Chris Gardner and published in the uh, 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 JAMA back uh, in 2007 called the A to Z study, um, Dr. Gardner uh, put people on either high carb, intermediate carb, or low carbohydrate diets and followed them for a year and published that data. And uh, the low carbohydrate diet people on average did better, not just initially, but over the longer term for many risk parameters. After he published that paper, he went back and re-examined the, the initial data and what he found was that when people were insulin resistant, and if you put them on a high carbohydrate diet, they did very poorly. If they're insulin resistant and they put them on a low carbohydrate diet, they did very well. Which says that the insulin resistance is a predictor of how well you respond and that carbohydrate restriction appears to be the better alternative for somebody who has this even normal blood sugar but high insulin value. That's, the, I think, the best current test we have available. There's many things happening that, that sort of fold into what we consider carbohydrate intolerance, but fundamentally what's happening is when you consume carbohydrate, if, if you're processing that in a healthy way, it's primarily being oxidized into carbon dioxide and water. You use it as fuel and muscle primarily. When you're carbohydrate intolerant, uh, a significantly greater portion of the incoming dietary carbohydrate is actually being converted to fat in the liver. So it's this uh, mismanagement of dietary carbohydrate that is fundamental to the carbohydrate intolerant state. And so if you follow sort of that metabolic path, if, if you're processing carbohydrates by converting them to fat, so de novo lipogenesis, uh, there are several downstream events that, that you could predict, such as uh, your triglycerides would go up in your blood, that uh, you start to show a certain lipoprotein cholesterol particle size pattern in your blood, characterized primarily by a predominance of the smaller LDL particles and this may be related to lower HDL. And of course, uh, this can lead down, down the road to higher blood sugars uh, and perhaps other features of metabolic syndrome. So I think if a person starts to, to show more of these features, that that's a harbinger that you know, they're, they're exceeding their body's carbohydrate tolerance and that they need to dial it down to, to get back into a, a level where they can manage it health, healthy. If a person is reasonably carbohydrate tolerant when they get to the point where they want to hold their weight stable. You can introduce carbohydrates back to the point where they begin to bump up against the point that the, 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 their, their level of intolerance. So as, as Jeff implied, if you measure blood triglycerides, and they started out with high triglycerides, they lost considerable weight, their, their, their blood lipoprotein pattern got better, and then you retest the triglycerides at, say, three months in the maintenance, and you see the triglycerides coming back up. They've probably gotten a little bit above where they should have been. They need to dial down in grams per day of carbohydrate. And that might be, for, in our experience, for people who have significant weight to lose or signs of metabolic syndrome. The upper end of carbohydrate tolerance for those people, even when they're normal weight, may be 100 to 150 grams per day. Um, most of those people should not go back to a high carbohydrate diet if they've gotten in trouble on high carb before. So if 100 grams per day of carbohydrate, that's 400 calories a day. Now, Mo a, most low carbohydrate diets, in fact, most diets that are good for human beings are going to be moderate in protein. This idea that high carb, I'm sorry, that low carb equals high protein is, is a, a, a dangerous myth. Um, because we humans don't burn protein very well as fuel. If you have a dog, your dog is very good at burning protein for fuel. But we humans, moderate protein. So for me, maybe 100 to 150 grams of protein per day. It's about four calories per gram. So that's between 400 and 600 calories. I don't want to get too technical. But let's say I, I, I don't, but I were over here eating 100 grams of carb a day, that's 400 calories. 150 grams of protein, that'd be 600 calories. 1,000 calories. But I'm you know, a, a 75 kilo, you know, 165 pound guy. I'm still pretty physically active and I burn over 2,500 calories a day. But between the, even the 100 grams a day of carb and the uh, 150 grams of protein, I've only got 1,000 calories. The rest has to come from fat. So you introduce back carbs to the point of carb tolerance. 
you keep protein moderate because we don't, humans, A, protein costs a lot, B, we don't feel well if we eat way too much of it. So protein in moderation, and then the remaining fuel that you need for maintenance will come from a healthy mix of fats. Uh, and that's how we put together what we have termed a well-formulated carbohydrate-controlled or carbohydrate-restricted regimen that allows people not just to lose weight reasonably easily, not easy, but more easily than on other dietary approaches, as shown in Chris Gardner's study, but then how one can make it last for decades, not for six months or so.